Hello and welcome to the very first of our Yarra Valley Writers' Festival New Release Sundays. It's been a tough winter for all of us, and particularly for those of us here in Victoria. But spring is sprung, and we thought what better time could there be to celebrate some new works from some terrific Australian authors. And to kick off we have a real treat. A conversation with the one and only Kate Grenville, the acclaimed and adored author of such works as The Lieutenant and The Secret River. In Kate's new work, A Room Made of Leaves, she continues the theme of bringing the stories of early colonial Australia to life, this one through the eyes of no less a character indeed than Elizabeth MacArthur. We do hope you enjoy Kate Grenville in the capable hands of ABC Radio National's Fiona Gruber. Thank you. Well, hello everybody, I'm Fiona Gruber and I'm delighted to be here um, on the land of the Tangerong Nation whose elders I acknowledge, past, present and future. And uh, it's beautiful rolling country here in central Victoria. And I'm really excited to be talking to you, Kate. Hello, Kate, in Hello, Melbourne. Fiona. Hello, Fiona. It's wonderful to be here. And I would like to say I'm in North Fitzroy. So I'm on the, I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri Willem people of the Kulin Nation, on which I'd like to acknowledge their elders past and present, and to acknowledge the many, many, many centuries of storytelling that has been done possibly on this very spot where I'm now sitting. So appreciation and acknowledgement of that. Well, you're a fabulous storyteller and I've enjoyed so many of your novels. And I was just thinking how A Room Made of Leaves and the life of Elizabeth MacArthur is just such a perfect story for this lockdown that we're in because the lives of women back in the late 18th century and early 19th century were, was one of perpetual lockdown in lots of ways. They were so constrained, weren't they? Yeah, that's a really brilliant image. I always say that I'm not especially interested in the past. All my books that are set in the past, their real themes are actually about the present. But when I was writing this one, I have to say that I did not foresee lockdown. But you're quite right, those women had zero power I mean, I can at least once a day, as, as you all can too, no doubt, once a day, I can go for a walk for one hour within five kilometres of my house. And if I choose to go alone, I can. And I come back to an independent life in which I have all kinds of power, including financial independence and so on. Those women had absolutely none of that, even those simple things that we take for granted. So yes, Elizabeth MacArthur's world is uncannily and unexpectedly like ours. Yeah, so I think we should start at the beginning because um, who, who was Elizabeth MacArthur and, and the basic premise of the book, which is that you discovered a secret cache of her letters. What, do, what did we know about Elizabeth MacArthur before this marvellous cache of letters? And what do we, you know, what have you uncovered in your fictional explorations? Okay, well, when I grew up, John MacArthur, who was Elizabeth MacArthur's husband, was called the father of the Australian wool industry. So he was supposed to have developed the modern merino, and he got a lot of credit for it. He was actually on the first $2 note, which I'm old enough to remember. Uh, of course, he shouldn't have been on it. His wife should have been on it, and we should have learned about the mother of the Australian wool industry. So they were a couple who came out to Australia in 1790, so very early. Uh, and John MacArthur was a ruthlessly ambitious bully, basically, who managed to squeeze every drop of advantage out of the new little colony of, uh, of New South Wales. Um, he and his wife had no money of their own. He was a very junior officer at the time. She was a farmer's daughter. He was the son of a draper. So they had a lot of, but he was very kind of he had a, a, a pride that was not based on anything in particular. So he really needed money and position to cement his sense of himself. So Elizabeth is married to this very unpleasant man um, and made a life. Now we did learn a tiny bit about Elizabeth MacArthur when I was small, which was that she was this devoted helpmeet to her husband, the perfect supportive wife. So when he was sent to England because he kept having duels with people, um, she took over the reins of the business and kept it going. Now, that was all we knew about her. And when I was doing a lot of background research for The Secret River back in about the year 2000, um, I came across some letters by Elizabeth MacArthur, which I have to say were pretty dull. Uh, 
they were pretty dull because women in those days uh, could only write dull letters. Letters were rather public documents. You didn't pour your heart out in a letter. So I thought, oh, what a yawn. You know, she was probably, a, she probably was a wonderful woman to run the business, but a bit boring. Um, but then I noticed something. I noticed that when you looked at the facts of her life and compared them to the letters, there was something that didn't fit. The facts of her life were tumultuous. You know, she was flung into this barbaric new colony with this utterly appallingly difficult husband. Uh, and yet the letters are kind of Pollyanna-ish, you know, everything's just hunky-dory. And it That's is so interesting. like that that a novelist gets interested. Yes, because I mean, I, you, you mentioned three things that I immediately find fascinating. One, that they both came from very modest family backgrounds. They were educated, but they were poor middle class. And yet over here, they were seen as aristocracy. That, that's one thing I'd like, I'd like to talk about first, actually, this idea of, you know, Lady, Lady MacArthur, she was called, wasn't she? And, and uh, she was uh, seen as, as part of that, you know, first upper class wave of early settlers, pioneers. Well, that is a tribute to John MacArthur's power of self-promotion, because he wanted it put around that he was of much higher stock than he really was. And in fact, he used to write to the British government saying, what Australia needs is an aristocracy, and I volunteer to be head of it. And so they start <laughs> oh, there. Me too, yeah. So yeah, that was one of the first myths. I mean, the thing is, that one of the things this book is about is about the myths that we develop about the past. The one of, about Elizabeth MacArthur being this, you know, boring, devoted wife. Um, and the other one about them being high class. There's something in the Australian psyche that is always looking for a duke. You know, people go looking for their family history until they finally find, you know, somebody higher up the pecking order than they, than they are. There's a deep snobbery, I think, that comes from, well, I think we're taught to be snobs, actually. Anyway, that's, that's that. Well, um, yep. English, in, in the English, in, English culture is, you know, completely class bound still. So it's not surprising, is it? That's right. I mean, they were English people, the MacArthur's after all. Yeah. They would have spoken with Devon accents. I mean, it's really interesting to think about that. They were not Australian. <laughs> That's true, because in the 18th century, there hadn't been that uh, sort of ironing out of um, accents and class that came from the great for public school system and the university system that just created this sort of received pronunciation middle class educated upper middle class so yes they would have had all different burrs and um intonations and their origins would have been really really strong because i we're jumping ahead now but i love the way that they never forget devon elizabeth MacArthur never forgets her origin she toasts the river tamar when you know in her little modest house in tiny sydney but we're leaping ahead of ourselves because this uh, the premise of this book, finding this cache of letters. When did you first decide that Elizabeth MacArthur, um, you know, was a really good subject to write about? In one of her letters, I found a phrase that hinted to me that she was more interesting than the myth about her. Uh, she had asked for some lessons in astronomy from the local astronomer, William Dawes, who I've also written about in a book called The, the Lieutenant. So she got the letters in this, she got the lessons uh, in astronomy uh, and she writes to a friend in England, um, I got the lessons, but I mistook my abilities and I blush for my error. Now that phrase, I blush for my error, it leapt off the page at me because everything else in the letters is so completely impersonal and bloodless. Suddenly here is a flesh and blood woman literally standing in front of you, blushing. Now, you know, uh, she's talking about a young man of her own age, the astronomer, who is quite an intriguing character. And she has described him as a rather mysterious character who is, you know, not often to be seen by mortal eyes because he's always looking at the stars. So anyway, I read, I blush at my error, and I thought, aha, Elizabeth MacArthur fancied William Dawes. Now, if that isn't an invitation for a novelist, I don't know what is. So it took me 20 years to write this book. I did write six other books in the meantime, I hasten to add. But from that day in the year 2000, when I read those letters and suddenly thought, wow, okay, there's a story here. It took me a long time to work out how to tell it. Well, there are a lot of problems, but one of them was how to tell it. 
And it wasn't until I moved to Melbourne, in fact, about three or four years ago, that I had the epiphany that I would pretend to be writing her memoirs. So these are the pretend memoirs of a real woman. And I've actually used several times real excerpts from the real letters of the real Elizabeth MacArthur in the State Library of New South Wales. So there's this little kind of little bit of grit at the centre of the novel, which is truth. And then the, well, I'm putting, putting uh, tickets on myself, the layers of, layers of pearly substance. I don't call this book a pearl, but layers of growth around that grit of fiction. And then there's a little bit more pretending to be fact. And then there's another layer of fiction. So it's many layers of things because that's what I'm really interested in. The whole notion of stories, what we should believe, how they get built up, why, uh, why some stories get believed and others don't, all those sorts of things. Well, it, it is fascinating because I um, read up on Elizabeth MacArthur and she has always, I mean, the um, Australian Dictionary of Biography entry, you know, writes about this woman of great respectability and virtue who, despite having a husband who was very controversial and disliked by many people, she was above blame and her piety was very important to her. And um, that's the image that we have of her through history. And your Elizabeth MacArthur is a very, a woman who would fit well into a book group in the 21st century. She's uh, a humanist. She's a proto-feminist. She's agnostic ver verging on atheist. She's, um, you know, she's a free thinker. She's a free spirit. Did you, um, did you consciously decide to just, you know, ignore those sort of stereotypes of early 19th century women and just go for a woman that you wanted, to, you wanted her to be? Uh, wanting her to be that was part of it, but I also feel very strongly that that stereotype of 19th, 18th and 19th century women does them a terrible disservice. The thing is, they were silenced. In their letters, they could only write what was publicly acceptable. In their novels, they could only write what was publicly acceptable. In other words, they had no way to reach across the centuries and write something down that could say, look, my public face has to be this terribly correct, pious thing. My real self is very different. My real self rages against the limitations of my life. Now, I think that you can actually detect that. For example, if you read Jane Austen, who is in fact a very close contemporary of Elizabeth MacArthur and also grew up in a very similar background because Elizabeth MacArthur actually grew up in a clergyman's house. She was kind of adopted by a clergyman. So you read Jane Austen and between the lines, Jane Austen isn't, you know, she knew that she would never get published if she wrote this stuff on the lines. Between the lines, there is this vivid sense of women chafing against the limitations of their lives. And the irony that Jane Austen employs was the only weapon they had. So it's as if Jane Austen has written this coded document that can be read, if you read it ironically, you hear the truth, which is that their lives were terrible. I, I can't believe that those women were that different from the way we are. Uh, yes, time has passed, but I do believe that, um, why would they not have thought, I'm as clever as that man, how come I'm not allowed to do any of the things he, he can do? Yes, because Elizabeth MacArthur, of course, I think even contemporary women would recognise the gentle art of male manipulation mm -hmm. that pervades, you know, the novel, a married to a very difficult man, but even even so, even if he's been less difficult, he has to think of all the clever ideas. He has to be the mover and shaker. And she has to just go, oh, that's so good, darling. What a brilliant idea. Even if she put it into his mind in the first place. And you, you convey that sense of a, of a marriage of where, where she at least is playing cat and mouse with him all the time because he's so unpredictable and potentially you hint violent as well. Yes, I think you're right that there, unfortunately, would be many, many, many women, uh, wives and also employees, who have perfected the art of putting an idea into a man's head, which he then presents as his own and gets all the credit for it. All around the world, I can, hear, I can feel people nodding in recognition at that. This is the thing that we've come a long way since the late 18th century as women in our um, freedoms. But we haven't come all the way yet. 
and we still live in a world where manipulation being you know being smart enough to to um to to be the power behind the throne is unfortunately still often necessary and acting at you know having an idea of what a lady should behave like as well i mean going back to the early the early days of elizabeth MacArthur's life which you cover beautifully in the novel there she is a poor daughter not particularly loved by her mother who's gone into a new marriage and sent to the clergyman's family and there she has her best friend young bridey and it's a beautiful evocation of two girls growing up having certain freedom because they're girls and then as they enter womanhood everything has to focus on whether or not they will get married mm -hmm. so why did elizabeth MacArthur marry john MacArthur? well that's one of the questions that got me started with this book one of the many ones because when you read you don't have to read much about john MacArthur to realize he didn't really have much going for him as a marriage prospect. He was, for example, very young. He had no money, he had no status. He wasn't good looking. He was scarred from childhood smallpox. And above all, his temperament was not pleasant. Even when he was a young man, that is very evident from some letters that have been left. Uh, whereas Elizabeth MacArthur in her documents does come across as a woman with a bit of a sense of humor and a very a pleasant one. Um, so that's the, that's the first question. Uh, in a Jane Austen world, the marriage would have been totally impossible. No money on either side. Uh, now, when you, you know, looking at, looking at historical stuff is fabulous. The first thing I always do with a book is just make a timeline. And I'm not the first person who has noticed that when John and Elizabeth MacArthur married, she must have been for about four months pregnant. There is no doubt about that. So that's okay. That's why they, that's why they got married. But given that he didn't seem to be much of a charmer, how did they get to that point? And one can, none of us will ever know. Um, so some writers about the MacArthur's say that they were so passionately in love that they, you know, jumped the gun. They were engaged and they jumped the gun. Now, I, I thought differently. Um, and so, well, you'll have to read the book to find out why Elizabeth MacArthur went behind the hedge with John MacArthur. And again, I think that many women, look, I can only say that when I was young and foolish, the kinds of men I was attracted to were, well, they were trouble, let's put it that way. And so I'm familiar with why a woman might, against all the dictates of common sense, go behind the hedge with the wrong guy. And of course, this is long before the contraceptive pill. So it only took one mistake. And I think that's what happened to Elizabeth MacArthur. Well, you do write in the book that she, a line where she says she, she suddenly knew what her size was, that she'd been a small little sort of mouse in the skin. Now, sex, attraction, being the object of desire made her gigantic. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we all recognise that feeling when we suddenly, as teenagers, realise we have a bit of sexual power. We actually, people seem to want to be with us, um, if we're lucky. And so that I just you know it just rang so true and that mixture of a sense of your life expanding yes. through being desired absolutely um, I mean it's why men in so many cultures have to hide us or lock us up or do terrible things to our sexual parts uh, because we actually do have power in that sense and that moment I mean Elizabeth MacArthur she described herself because she lost her father, her little sister, her mother went off and got remarried and didn't take her. She lost every sort of support that a person might have. She went to live with the clergyman. And as she says, I felt that I had to fold myself up small and put myself away where no one could see because she had to be a real goody gumboil living with the clergyman. And in the moment behind the hedge, when she's, so, when she's being, you know how men can do it, flatter us and tell us how beautiful we are and how gorgeous and you know how painful it is not to be able to do what they want with us in that moment she suddenly thinks aha i can unfold this is the moment for me to unfold into my full size and how many women have made that mistake <laughs> to, to unfold she says uh in the wrong moment with the wrong person and to spend the rest of your life paying the price that's right. And of course, um, for many women, 
uh, it, it could have been a disaster. But for the MacArthur's, even though, as you as you you know say, they're very ill suited. The the fact that there was a new colony and he signed up uh, to go to New South Wales because it, it was the only way that he because he was terribly in debt, wasn't he? And yeah. He uh, really had to go far away to either escape his debt or to work out a way of making enough money to pay them back. Yes, well, by, by, by being prepared to go to New South Wales, which was the end of the earth, nobody wanted to go there. Uh, the, the only way they could get people to go there would, would, was to offer them promotion and various other perks. And so MacArthur knew, because he was 500 pounds in debt, it is said, um, that that was his only chance promotion and the opportunity to, you know, get other kinds of sort of perks through the military, his only chance of getting ahead. So that's why they went. It was certainly not a matter of choice. They were not adventurers by any means. Uh, now, I know you, you, you used a lot of um, original material to describe that early colony. I mean, they were, were they on the second ship out or the third ship out? They were very, very early arrivals, weren't they? And they it was tiny. The yeah, they were on the and second. Was, of, which is, mm, sorry. Sorry, people were starving, I was just going to add. Uh, that's right. The second, the first fleet was one thing. That's where Captain Philip came out and all that. And that was pretty bad. I mean, they, they starved when they got here. But the second fleet was notorious for having been utterly corrupt. And some gigantic proportion of the unfortunate convicts died because they were chained chained to each other in the hold like slaves basically in fact i th have a feeling one, at least one of the ships was an ex-slave ship uh so the it was a hugely brutal uh fleet that they were on so she arrived i mean this is a i mean it, we would have to imagine one of jane austen's heroines take elizabeth bennett you know a clever girl but not much experience of the world plunged into the most squalid violent, barbaric penal colony where people were flogged. I mean, 100, 200 lashes, you know, all that brutality we've, we've read about. That's what she, that's the world she suddenly entered. And, you know, my instinct that there must be a story behind Elizabeth MacArthur, when I actually thought about who she was and where she had to go, I thought, what an extraordinary woman she must have been, not to have been just kind of um, overwhelmed by that. Instead, she rose to the occasion. Yes, because she had one child and, uh, you know, having, having children in those days was dangerous enough. Having been pregnant on board a ship where it took months and months and months to get to um, your destination and then having more children in your colony. I mean, it must have been extraordinarily difficult for, for women uh the the accounts i mean i love the early you know attempts at high society in the colony with the the salons that elizabeth MacArthur holds where you know or even the dinner parties the governor gives where it's really a horrible bit of boiled beef or salted cod and you know it's all rations and uh everyone's keeping up uh, appearances but that a lot of that comes from what content doesn't it he wrote the first account he was a a young officer here in uh, New South Wales, and he wrote the first account. Does he talk much about Elizabeth MacArthur in his account of the early colony? Does he mention her? There are many mysteries about this whole time, and one of them is that, as you say, what Contench was a very sociable, fabulously uh, interesting, entertaining, and probably rather attractive man who wrote a very entertaining account of his first two years in, in the colony. Now, he would have known Elizabeth MacArthur well. There's no way he couldn't have. And yet, she is not mentioned anywhere in his text, except just as a throwaway line in a footnote. Nor is John MacArthur mentioned. Now, John MacArthur stood like a colossus in this place, or not like a colossus, but like a, a thorn in everybody's side. So in a way, I think when you go back to those sources, you have to listen to the silence as much as you listen to what's on the page. Why didn't Tench mention John MacArthur? Not even once. And why, did, why didn't he mention her in the, she was the only, 
there were only two sort of genteel women in the colony in that first year, Mrs. MacArthur and the wife of the clergyman. Uh, so, you know, Elizabeth MacArthur was a most unusual person. Why does she not feature in Tench's account? Except in you know, so of course, I took that silence and I invented a whole story about it, which is that um, Elizabeth MacArthur was doing all sorts of things that she would rather not her husband kind of know about. And she was terrified that Tench might write about her in the book and that would dump her in it with her husband. Tench might perhaps unwittingly say something that would get Elizabeth into big trouble with her husband. So she begs Tench, please, on your honour as a gentleman, Mr Tench, do not mention me in your book. And he says, oh, you have my word, Mrs MacArthur, I will not mention you in my text. And then years later, she reads the book and she says, well, yes, I'm not mentioned in your text, but there I am in the footnote. You, you tricky little customer, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I, you know, because of course it could have been uh, MacArthur standing over Tench going, don't you dare, you know, besmirch my wife virtue by even mentioning her name. Um, she's my property. But because of course he's, he comes across, your, your tent is wonderfully, wonderfully flirty and a bit dangerous and you would have imagined you know the you know one of the more interesting people in the colony mm -hmm. but of course her eyes you know as, as you mentioned at the beginning her, her eyes turned to one of the other men in the colony the astronomer William Dawes so and, and of course you've as you said you've written about him in the lieutenant so um was it like sort of bringing him back Oh, I, had, I felt unfinished with, with William Dawes when I'd finished the lieutenant, partly because in early drafts of the lieutenant, um, there, were, there was a character called Elizabeth MacArthur who came across him and was clearly attracted to him. Now, in the lieutenant, um, he didn't reciprocate because he was already satisfied he had a convict mistress. But there she was, this powerful little fusion between Dawes and Elizabeth MacArthur in that old draft of the lieutenant. And of course, she, she dropped out. She's left on the cutting room floor with the lieutenant. So it was a huge pleasure when I realised I would be writing about her again to realise that I could then blossom this little thing that I had always thought about, which is that, you know, they were attracted to each other. I think it would be difficult to, you know, you sit down with a young man of your own uh, age and he's teaching you something that requires, you know, close quarters looking at an orrery, which is a, a little mechanism that shows how the planets, the solar system works. Um, you know, teach a pupil, it's a kind of recipe for attraction. Anyway, that's my theory and I'm sticking to it. Um, after all, this is fiction, it is not history. But I have tried, I, I have been, I have tried, I, I, I want to have it both ways, basically. So I have not done anything that is absolutely impossible. It's unlikely, I think, that the real Dawes and Mrs. MacArthur had an actual affair, but it is not absolutely impossible. I know I've set it up in the book that it's kind of plausible. So it was a huge pleasure to come back to this very intriguing rather romantic, rather mysterious astronomer, and to give him a whole a character. And of course, in the book, he serves a very important function because he introduces Elizabeth MacArthur to the local Aboriginal people, the Gadigal. And he's doing that because, as is historical fact, uh, he's learning the Gadigal language and making a proper study of it. He's the only person to have done that. Um, so, if she visited him out there to learn astronomy, I think it was extremely likely that she also met uh, some of his Aboriginal friends and got to know them. And of course, that would have put her in a very different category from many of the other people in the colony who were not in the position of meeting Aboriginal people in almost a social setting. So that kind of opened a door for her that then allowed me with the book to open up the whole idea of um, what happened in those years, the British coming in and dispossessing an entire, you know, group of people, the first Australians, taking over an entire country and throwing them off it. So it, doors opened that door for me, so to speak. And she, yes, 
he he introduces her to local Aboriginal people who were just sitting around his hut, chatting with him, learning, learning. He's learning their language. They're learning his. It's a it's a mutual respect, which was, of course, sorely, sorely lacking. And uh, we know, don't we, that in fact Elizabeth McCarthy was interested and sympathetic towards Aboriginal people, wasn't she? Because she wrote about a, one woman in particular. Yes, the record on her relationships with Aboriginal people is interesting. Uh, there is a very early letter where she describes a woman called Daringa uh, coming into her hut in, in Sydney and showing her her baby, showing Elizabeth MacArthur her baby. Uh, the baby's wrapped in uh, paper bark, which would make actually quite an effective little blanket. And Elizabeth MacArthur writes back home to her friend, you know, this woman brought the baby in and she describes Daringa the baby, the paper bark wrapper, in a, in, not in a condescending way, not in a, oh, look at these weird people, but it's a very affectionate, sympathetic, empathetic uh, relationship. I can imagine that not sharing a single word of language, those two women, you know, something nice happened there. That's definitely the mood of the letter. And she also says, you know, here are some names of Aboriginal people. Hear how beautiful they are. So in that sense, she was very sympathetic. Now, later on, uh, the, the record gets a little bit more mixed. And of course, my book conveniently finishes in 1801, 1801. But at the point where the MacArthur Empire spread out further into the hinterland, things got a little bit more complicated. And I'm not sure we can make any assumptions about what she felt then. But certainly... Yeah, well, that... Sorry, my, my, my kind of agenda in the book was to open something up and the best way to do it was to have somebody whose mind, like Dawes, was open, respectful and sympathetic to the Aboriginal um, reality. But you do, I mean, we go forward 40 years, don't we? So we end, there she is, they've got an estate, Elizabeth um, Farm in Parramatta, and then they've got other lands. And there are, there's a battle of Parramatta. And I, I, I think, I mean, you've covered it in your, your previous books as well, but that idea that as well as being victims, there were warriors, there were people fighting back, so, you know, resisting this land grab. And your Elizabeth MacArthur recognises this incredibly uncomfortable position, doesn't she, that, that it's not their land? She does. And she's prepared to live with the fact that there is kind of, um, uh, there is no kind of easy answer to that. In fact, there, there was for her. She could have just gone back to England. But given that I'm actually more interested in today rather than yesterday, um, somebody like me, I'm just, you know, five generations, my ancestors have been here. I don't actually, I couldn't go back to Bermondsey. There wouldn't be anywhere for me there. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, th this is a subject that has really occupied me in my last four books of fiction, I suppose. This whole dilemma of the fact that you know the British came in and they 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 took the land against as you say vigorous and very effective opposition from Aboriginal warriors but they did finally take it and what are we today to do with that un, un, unpleasant and indigestible fact you know we acknowledge the elders we acknowledge the land that's all a huge improvement we know the actual name of the people who were on our particular bits of Australia, which is a huge advance from my childhood when there was no sense of, it was just all you know, like Aboriginal people. In fact, I think we called them Aborigines, even more insulting, which we would, um, you know, so these days we can, we, I can say I live on Wurundjeri land, but I am living on Wurundjeri land. What do I do about that? I can, you know, I have nowhere else to go. So that's, that's the idea that I wanted to explore with Elizabeth MacArthur. And the other thing I wanted to explore was the fact that um, she and her husband dispossessed a particular set of Barramatagal people of a particular hundred acres. Um, and I had kind of already told a story very like that in The Secret River. That's, that's a story that I think is kind of fundamental but I'd sort of already told it. With this one, I saw that I could go one stage further. I could tell the story, not of the dispossession, but I could examine the stories that were being told about the dispossession. 
because one when when one set of people kind of defeats another set of people they then build up a whole set of stories about it that makes it okay we all want to justify ourselves so the battle of Parramatta, in my reading of it is one of those times when the british told a story to each other that helped them to justify what they were doing that is violently displacing and in that case killing uh, people who were defending their homeland, Barramatagal people and others who were defending their homeland. So I wanted to crack apart. I wanted to say, look, we've inherited these stories about what, you know, we, my lot, the settler lot did. We've inherited the stories. We shouldn't believe them. As Elizabeth MacArthur says, do not believe too quickly. Take those stories, those, those myths that we tell each other, those comforting myths, crack them open. Think about how it might really have been, because on the other side of it is another set of stories. Now, the fantastic thing about being a writer at this moment in history, an Australian writer at this moment in history, is that Indigenous writers of all, of all nations are writing their stories about those days. And that is, that is fantastic. And it makes it all the more important for us settler Australians to really <clears throat> to really examine the stories that we've always believed. Well, yes, you are in an extraordinary position because you're not, well, I'll start that. You are in a, an extraordinary position in, in one sense in that you uh, can tell stories. You're, you describe yourself for shorthand sometimes as a his, writer of historical fiction, but I've read otherwise you say, no, I'm a, you know, I'm a novelist. I choose history as my canvas. But there's a, there's a difference, isn't there, between a historical novelist and someone who, you're a bit like Hilary Mantel in a sense, you use the canvas to tell, uh, you know, you're captivated by the characters and you want to take them as far into journeys that are part of your imagination, uh, but they're very informed uh, journeys. Um, so you're, you're telling this very, you're telling this story of early settlement, which is sympathetic more sympathetic to uh, the, the white folks than previous accounts have been. But, uh, you know, how does that fit in? How, how have they been received? Because I know, you know, you've received flack in the past about the Secret River as much as it has been one of the most adored and, um, you know, exciting books and TV series and has, you know, made you incredibly well known around the world. But, you know, how do you deal with the, the conflicting histories that uh, are swimming around now when, you know, history is more up for grabs than ever in a way. Look, I actually avoid using the word history because it's, it means many different things to many different people. I just say, and I do accept the label historical novel, it's a shorthand as you say, but actually what I write is fiction that happens to be set in the past. And I do draw a lot on the historical record, but that doesn't mean I'm writing about history. Um, you mentioned that I wrote a sort of a sympathetic account of the white people. I think the reason I got into trouble is that actually I didn't. In the Secret River, I, I broke apart, pulled down off its, off its, off its pedestal, actually, the, the comfortable pioneer myth that we had been told about those early settlers. Um, and that was exactly what I wanted to do, to say, look, we need to look at this. We have been, as, as white Australians, we have for 250 years been telling each other comfortable myths about those early days. What we need to do is to actually think our way through into how it might actually have been, to read beyond the words that those that our white forebears left. They left very cleaned up accounts of what happened. And those accounts are also full of huge, eloquent silences. That's, that is the, the project for us white people in Australia today. And particularly, I think that's, as a novelist, the one thing I can do is to imaginatively enter those parts of, parts of the past, parts of the historical record, which are the gaps. They are silences, and some of them are deliberate gaps. And there is no way other than by imagining your way into them in an informed way, not just making anything up out of thin air, um, to enter that in an informed way to say, this is not necessarily how it happened, but this is a way of starting to think about what might have happened there. And without actually thinking truthfully about those early days, which are actually not that long ago, 
you know, there were still massacres happening in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, without really truly looking at that stuff, which is difficult to look at, very confronting, but we can't move forward until we've done that. Well, now that you have written four novels that do, do explore them from different angles and different characters, that early period, uh, do you uh, do you think you've um, sort of are you sated? Uh, do you feel you've got something out of your system, or are there more more characters, more aspects of that period or a later period in Australian history that you're aching to write about? Ah, interesting. Look, when I wrote The Secret River, I didn't even think I was writing one novel, let alone <laughs> what is now a quartet of novels. Um, I had actually given up writing because I had my... Oh, it's a long, sad story. Um, I'd always had critical acclaim, couldn't make a living. The idea of perfection, which, was, which I had just published, just fell over like a lead balloon. But even the publishers said to me, what's your next book about, Kate? And then, of course, from the orange. Uh, yeah, incredible. <laughs> um, I they mean, had to keep their words, didn't they, Kate? They, they never did. They never did. Um, but it then went on to win the Orange Prize, which was like salvation from above. But in the meantime, I had thought I'd better make myself properly um, qualified as a teacher of creative writing. So I'll write a thesis about my convict ancestor, Solomon Wiseman. Uh, which I also want to find out about and that'll get me the bit of paper and I can then just be a teacher of creative writing for the rest of my life and forget writing. So that story about my convict ancestor, well, it grew like Topsy and it finally became the novel, which is now The Secret River. Uh, and of course, in the course of researching that, I found out about, about William Dawes, I found out about Elizabeth MacArthur and I realised that... Um, the generation after Solomon Wiseman was also a story. So one thing just kind of opened into another. Now, there are stories in this recent book, A Room Made of Leaves, um, which could easily open up. I mean, there's a character called Mrs. Brown, who has a little thing with a, another character called William Hannaford. Now, they are characters who I'm very drawn to. I find them very attractive. There's a story there, whether I'll ever write it, you know, I'm, I'm getting on. So but up there's down to the Parramatta River. There is no <laughs> end to the stories one can tell. If, if once, you, once you invent a world, it seems to be totally real to me. So you can kind of go anywhere with it. Well, when you invented that world, I know some writers who, they, they, they become obsessed with finding objects from that period. Are you like that? Do you have any little talismanic um, <laughs> goods? from the late 18th, early 19th century? I do actually have a few, yes. Interesting that you ask me that. Um, my ancestor was transported for stealing some timber. Uh, he was a lighterman on the Thames, a bargeman. And I found my way to the particular bit of the Thames where he was nabbed that night and hauled off to prison. Uh, and when the tide goes out, there's a big beach there. And on that beach are all kinds of ye olde stuff, including nails. I should have brought one in to show you. Huge old fashioned nails, which are clearly, a they've, they've been hammered out. You know, they're not sort of drawn wire, they're handmade nails. And roof tiles, which are probably from Tudor times, a little bit of clay. If I've got one here, I sometimes do. No, I don't little bit of clay where you can see that a, a stick has been poked through the clay when it was wet in order to tie the tile on. Now those things, and I've also got a great collection of what my mother called chainies, little bits of broken china, uh, oh. broken plates and cups and things. I told an Irishman once, I said, my, why did my mother call them chainies? And he said, oh, well, they're chainies, you know, in his Irish accent, suddenly made sense. Anyway, when I really get hopeless with a book and want to give up on it, I often go back to those physical things and think this really, you know, those people were there. I've, I, it must be possible to, it's worth doing, going back and trying to get into their, into their world. Well, yes, Mrs. MacArthur's piano, that little, ah. uh, you know, William Dawes' instruments. You know, you just wonder, you know, it is fascinating, isn't it? Because you think of things as being shiny and new and then when the time we come to see them, they're very old and broken down and worn and yet 
they were handled by people who were contemporaries, if not those people themselves. So, yes, I mean, you, I know you write loads and loads of drafts. What, you wrote 23 drafts for The Secret River, is that right? I'm embarrassed you, to say that it's actually more than 23. Um, 23 you admit to. The last one that I actually sent off, which was edited, was called Draft 34. Um, they're not really complete drafts, but they're just, I hand write, I print them out, each, each draft I print out, and then I scribble all over it by hand, and once I can no longer read it, I do it all again and call it another draft. So it's not quite as bad as it sounds, but it does take me a, a lot of goes to get it right. And I know this is a question that will really interest budding writers. Are you a, an adder or a subtractor? Are you someone who kind of strikes out those adjectives or fleshes out after writing the bare bones of an idea or a dialogue? Ah, look, I think I'm both. Can I be both? Um, You're allowed to be. Yeah. What I am is a person who um, I don't start at the beginning with writing. I, f I would find that impossibly difficult. Uh, what I do, I'm a great believer in the unconscious. And long ago, somebody said to me, just follow the energy. And that is my rule of thumb as a writer. So you write a little piece. And you think, oh, well, that's what I should be writing. I need to write that scene. But you know that it has no life. It has no energy. So forget it. It's probably never going to come right. Because there's probably some other bit of that same story that you're going to tell. There's a bit that you think, oh, when I get to that bit, I'll be all right. Well, I'm somebody, I'm a very disorganised person. I start there. I start there with the bit that has energy and life. And I trust that from there the story will kind of um, build bit by bit and it won't be built in the right order, which is partly why the 34 drafts, it'll be millions of little bits and pieces. Uh, but I can then go through them, rearrange them, chuck out the ones that don't have energy and perhaps put a few more adjectives into some of them, perhaps take adjectives out, nothing wrong with adjectives. After all, Christina Stead, for example, who is a great writer, would have something like 10 adjectives in a row. She, of course, refused editing. No editor would allow her to do that these days. Well, it's good, it's good that you defend the florid. I think that's important. <laughs> hmm. So, okay, so you now you've, you know, obvious next question. So what was the first bit of A Room Made of Leaves that you wrote? Ah, um, what was it? It was probably part of the relationship with Dawes. I think it was, because I already knew that material really well from having written The Lieutenant. Uh, yes, um, I think it was the moment at which she goes into his hut, which I had a very vivid image of, and sits down with the orrery, which he had made for her. That's a fact. He did actually make her an orrery, heaven knows how. It's a complicated little mechanism, an orrery. And, they would and have it does show him. an affection for someone to go to that effort, doesn't it? Absolutely. You're quite right. He was obviously a very keen teacher, but you're quite right. And I hadn't quite thought of that. Uh, he really wanted to teach her. He must have felt something. Well, here was this woman at an age when women often were not even taught to read and write, let alone do any. And geometry was considered much too hard for women. Here was a woman coming to him and saying, here I am on the underneath of the world where every star is different the moon may be the same but all the stars are different what an amazing place i'm in will you teach me about it and you know an intelligent man which he obviously was and a thoughtful one would have thought ah okay this woman's a bit different she actually wants to know this wants to understand about this new place instead of saying oh isn't it different isn't it inferior she's saying this is an opportunity to, to embrace a new place that I don't understand. And she blushes when she realises that, A, she's much more ignorant than she, than she thought about the fundamentals of astronomy, but B, as you suggest, for another reason as well. That's yes, I think um, one of the lovely things about Elizabeth MacArthur's real letters is that you can often read them two ways. So... I mean, we blush for a lot of different reasons, and they're both possible in that letter. One is that she's, you know, embarrassed that she's proved herself stupid. I mean, astronomy is hard. So she could have blushed for that reason, but also blushes are very much 
a sexual signal. So, you know, her letter encompasses both those possibilities. They're both there in the words. As her letters very often are poised on very clever knife edges. Her husband was sent away for four years at one point and she must have been so glad to see the back of him for four years. She must have been so pleased. And when he comes back after four years, she's been given a bit of warning and she writes to a friend, I have just heard that Mr. MacArthur is just about to return. You can imagine my feelings on the return of Mr. MacArthur. Well, knowing what we do about Mr. MacArthur, we can well imagine her feelings, but you see what I mean? The sentence is beautifully, beautifully balanced between the... That's right. It would and the fool Irish. him into thinking she was looking forward to seeing him, but nobody else would be fooled for a moment. Exactly. Um, well, that's right. It's, it's like when in art school, you learn about negative space. You're the mistress of negative space. You kind of see the gaps and, and fill them. And um, what I love about the structure of the book as well is I love the fact that there are small chapters, they're little fragments. There's a, the way that you've, you've structured it is a thought here, an event there that uh, draws the reader in, you know, in a sort of wonderful organic way. It's like they're looking at leaves while they're walking through a woodland. Well, when I came across the idea of writing the memoir, writing it as, as if it was her memoirs, um, that gave me the chance that I didn't have to write the sort of boringly smooth narrative. Because when you write your memoirs, you do tend to just write little vignettes, the little bits you remember that stand out. It's a bit like a photo album, actually, except it's words. And of course, the, um, I thought of the memoirs first, and I thought, oh, that's a nice idea. But then I thought that I could wrap that in another layer of fiction and pretend that I had come across these memoirs uh, wrapped in, you know, in a tin box in the roof space of Elizabeth Farm. I mean, how would I come across them in Elizabeth Farm? But anyway, um, the book begins with an introduction by someone called Kate Grenville, who claims that she's found these memoirs and all she's done is transcribe them and, you know, publish them. Hasn't, hasn't written a word of them. Uh, so that was a lovely, I really enjoyed that kind of dance between the, the real and the imagined and the memoir form gave me a chance uh, to keep it lively in all kinds of ways. I loved it. Thank goodness I thought of it. Thank you, Melbourne. I give Melbourne full credit for being the place where I came across that idea. Oh, really? So that's, that's very good indeed. Um, well, we're, we're, we're pretty much running out of time now. Um, I, I'd love to just know, are you working on anything right now? I'm very interested in my grandmother. I seem to be... Uh, Women of the past is an inexhaustible source of interest. Yeah, their stories haven't been told, and they should be. Well, I look forward to reading your next book. Kate Grenville, thank you very much indeed. It's been absolutely brilliant talking to you for so long. I feel very blessed. Thank you, Fiona. It's been really good fun talking to you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, how wonderful to hear from someone as accomplished and indeed charming as Kate Grenville in conversation there with a brilliantly prepared Fiona Gruber. And hasn't she set the bar high for me? Because next week it's yours truly in conversation with actor, raconteur, old mate of mine, now author and Yarra Valley resident, John Wood, talking about his life uh, through his new book, which just for the title has got to be a winner, How I Clawed My Way to the Middle. Can't wait for that one. I hope you can join us. So goodbye from the Arrow Valley Writers' Festival.